Hi, Robin. It's an interesting time on the global financial market, isn't it? 2022 will go down as one of the most testing years for investors in the modern era. That's right, Abraham. Much as you and I try to encourage investors not to pay too much attention to financial market news, let's face it, it's hard to escape it at the moment. As you say, it's been a tough year for almost all investors because now, it's not just stocks that have fallen in value, government bonds, which normally provide a buffer against stock market volatility, well, they've been badly hit as well. Yes, but of course, in times like this, investors need to focus on what they can control and not what they can't. Yes, that's right. And one of the things you can control is cost. Put simply, the less you pay as an investor, the more you keep for yourself. And our guest on this episode is a staunch advocate of keeping your investment costs down. He's the academic author and asset manager, David Pitt Watson. Like me, David is an ambassador for the Transparency Task Force, which campaigns for a fairer, more transparent investing industry. Okay, Robin, let's hear what David has to say. David Pitt Watson has worked in the asset management industry for several decades. He also lectures on the subject at the University of Cambridge. One of his main interests is value for money. He's the co-author of a book published in 2016 called What They Do With Your Money which called into question the value provided by the global financial industry. What the financial system does is fundamentally important. Getting our money from where it is to where it's needed, we need that for our prosperity, for sustainability, for all of those sorts of things, Robin. But if you've ever worked in the financial system, it, it, it isn't a, always focusing on doing that. There are lots and lots of activities that take place in the financial system that cost really a lot of money that are not in the interests of the people that it should be serving, which are the savers, and also, by the way, is the companies that are wanting to borrow or, or, or issue shares. So let me give a, a, an example where I just, I, I don't get this. So there's a thing called high-frequency trading. And a high-frequency trader is somebody who pays the stock, ex often, not always, often pays the stock exchange to have their computer very close to the stock exchange's computer, can see you and me coming in to want to do a trade with one another, where we would share whatever was the spread on all of that, does the trade with you and me in microseconds and takes the spread from that trade. I don't understand what the value of that is. So you were willing to sell for 99 pence, I was willing to buy for 101 pence. And in the microsecond before we met each other, somebody bought from me at 99 and sold to you for 110. High frequency trading costs a fortune. Big, huge computers, yeah? Trading networks, information systems, and they don't deliver any value. And indeed there is a, 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 a really quite sobering study done by a guy in uh, at New York University, a, a French professor called Thomas Philippon. And he said, well, let's try and work out the productivity of the finance industry. So we'll, let's go back over 100 years and say, you know, what was the proportion of the GDP that was spent on the finance industry? How much money did they take from the real world and then invest back in the real world? And then if we divide one by the other, we can find out what the cost was of taking the money from the real world back into the real world. And he found almost no increase in productivity at all over 100 years. Now, a, and you know, he adjusted for smaller bank accounts and all of these sorts of things. If he's even half right, that's really terrible. And we in the finance industry, look, I've devoted most of my professional life to the finance industry. We really need to sober up about this and think about what is the purpose of our industry? It is so important. How are we managing it? Are the things that we're doing truly purposeful? And how is it that we pull the levers to get them to be more purposeful? And if you want to do more, you're very welcome to come along to my lectures at Cambridge, because that's what they're about. 
Now, commentators like Abraham Ockersnyer and I are often talking about the cost of investing, and we make no excuse for it. Why? Because the fees and charges you pay are very important. They might seem quite small, but when you factor in the effects of compounding, they can make a huge difference to your eventual returns. So fees are usually charged on the balance on your account. So you put in your first thousand pounds and you pay 1% on that, so it's 10 pounds. And then the next year you put in another thousand pounds, so you've got 2,000 pounds and 1% is 20 pounds. And that's typically how fund manager fees are paid. By the way, there can also be other fees that you don't ever get to hear about. So if they're trading shares, for example, on your behalf, that costs money, but you won't uh, necessarily see that uh, in the statement that you're getting. Although there are some reforms that are coming in we've been involved in where th this will be uh, considerably improved. How much difference do they make? Um, let's say that you start a uh, saving for your pension at age 25, which is what we would recommend everybody to do. You save until you're 65, 66. You then retire and you have a 20 year retirement and you take 1% every year from that growing balance and then the declining balance. 25% of your money has gone in fees, of your possible pension has gone in fees. If it charges 2%, and remember this is both the fees that you see and the fees that you don't see, half your possible pension has gone in fees. If it's 3%, um, it then comes to two thirds because so much fees have been charged in the earlier years, it doesn't go up to 75%. So these make a really, 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 really big difference, which is why I, you know, when I'm talking to people, I just go on and on and on. Always look at the fees, always look at the fees, especially for long-term investments. When you buy something in a shop, the price you pay is usually plain to see, but paying to invest is very much more complicated. Why? Because there are several layers of charges, some of which can be quite opaque. The reason it's a little bit complicated, but it, it's a problem solved in Holland and in Denmark and in Canada and other countries, so it is soluble, is there's a fee that the fund manager takes for themselves for providing their services. And that might include um, uh, th that'll include all of their fees and their office costs and uh, you know their marketing and da, 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 that covers all of that. But what about if they trade a share? So um, there'll be a brokerage fee on trading the share, but what happens if the fee on trading a share is a spread? So I described you selling me a share at 99 pence and me buying it at, at 101 pence and the broker has taken that two pence spread. How do you know that somebody's paid for that, haven't they? That's been somebody else's share that your fund manager. How do you include that in the overall fees? So typically what people are seeing is the headline fee that the fund manager um, is charging, but they're not seeing a clear statement of what the other fees are. Now this is changing, number one. Uh, a, the headline fee on a default pension is now capped. I'm pleased about that. Um, a, a, and there is an independent governance committee that's supposed to be looking at all of these sorts of things. But right now you do not see the full fees that are charged. And as I said, a 1% can make a huge difference. So you do need to see that and you need to know what that's likely to do to your pension or to any long-term saving. Of course, financial advice adds another layer of fees. And David Pitt Watson says you should make sure you're not overpaying. He also urges people to steer clear of advisors who claim to have the ability to predict the future and to know which funds will outperform. So I think the financial advisor, first of all, starts by asking you what you want to do with the rest of your life, what you want to do with your money. What, what's your total balance sheet? So you've got your house, you've got your, you know, all, all those various different other things that you've got. You've got your, your pension, which is probably worth quite a lot, but is maybe in a company DB fund. Some. Let's look at all of this. How does that match what you think you might want to do um, going out into the future? And then how is it for the investable cash that we've got that we make sure that that is addressing any gaps that you might have in your expectations? The, the big value bit in it is not, oh, I've discovered this wonderful new fund that Neil Woodford is, and I'm sure you're going to make loads of money out of that. The, the big value is in saying, these are your particular characteristics. This is the portfolio of assets that you've got. Here's the 
liabilities and the expenses that you might have, we've matched those two to a reasonable degree at low cost. You can feel comfortable about what you're doing. Finally, how does David Pitt Watson invest his own money? Well, it'll probably come as little surprise to learn that he's a big believer in index funds. A, I have almost all of it in index funds. Some balance as I get older in, in, in uh, 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 bonds. Um, it's reasonably well diversified, although it, it actually it isn't terribly global. And people would say, I would have done better if I've invested globally. I've actually probably got it a bit overweighted towards the UK, but I sort of think to myself, I want to live in this country. I'm British. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the fate of Britain um, in, 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 in my pension fund. Uh, it is at low cost because, you know, particularly if you're buying shares, you get a vote with those shares. I want to know that that vote is being used in a sensible way so that we have long-term profitable companies, because I, obviously I want profitable companies for my pension, but I don't want that profit made in a way that's going to I, I make society or the planet somewhere that I don't want to live in my retirement and that I don't want my kids inheriting. So, Abraham, what did you make of what David Pitt Watson had to say there? He clearly feels very strongly, doesn't he, about the asset management industry, the important role it has to play, and the need to provide value for money. Yes, indeed. I mean, for me, there are two important takeaways from this. The first is really about transparency and how complicated it is for professionals, let alone, um, you know, the end investors to actually understand what I call the layer cake of fees that comes as a result of managing their money. And to understand that financial services, for the most part, um, extract significant value from our money in the process of, of managing it. The other point, though, is about the magnitude of the fees. It's, it's really big. You know, the way I like to think about this is if you agree that companies and people, employees, uh, are the ones working very hard to generate returns, all the, the investment management industry is really doing is taking capital from people who need it and trying to allocate the capital to the companies who need it. Now, you might say, well, what's that intermediation worth? Nobody would agree that it's worth 25, 50% of the returns in the long run. So they don't make any difference to the aggregate return of companies and people in the work that they do. Why should they take such a huge chunk um, of our investment. And depending on what you look at the number, when you compound fees over 20, 30 years, you're looking at between a third, uh, as much as half in some cases, of the overall return being swallowed up um, in fees to the, to, to the asset management industry. Yes, the figures David gives for the impact of fees and charges are quite extraordinary, aren't they? Paying just 1% a year to invest takes away 25% of your eventual returns. And in total, most investors are paying considerably more than that. It, it, it's incredible. And people don't tend to um, really understand this, Matt, because we say, oh, you know, they're taking 1% of your investment. Um, you know, you think, well, that that's not a lot. You know, 2% of your investment doesn't seem like a lot. But the thing you need to remember is you are putting up 100% of the capital. You are taking 100% of the risk. If you are paying, let's say, a fee of 2% on 
um, you know, investment and, and the investment return um, happens to be 6%, over a 30-year period, you're paying half of the returns, um, you know, to the investment management. It, it, it's what the, my hero in, in, in investment, the, the legendary Jack Bogle, calls the tyranny of fees. It's so hard to, to get our heads around this, but, but, but it's real. And that's why um, investors, uh, financial advisors, you know, uh, you know, professionals have to be uh, cognizant of, of, of this important fact. Organisations like the Transparency Task Force and Gina Miller's True and Fair campaign have done excellent work in recent years in raising awareness of fees and charges and the fact that they're often quite opaque. Abraham, what more would you like to see done to improve transparency in the investing industry? Well, as you mentioned, those organizations are doing a brilliant job. You know, the work that you're doing, Robin, raising awareness is very, very important. I am taking a, a very different tack. You know, for, for several years, uh, you know, I, I have come to the conclusion that, you know, campaigning, in my word, complaining doesn't actually move the needle ma massively. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why we, you know, we're building, um, you know, a challenger in the sort of investment management industry. And we're now at the point, you know, we've just gone through an exercise, uh, essentially negotiating uh, institutional fees for investors in, in the portfolios that we manage. And we're at the point where actually, the, the total investment cost, you know, we exclude advice, you know, and platform from this, but the total investment cost for a globally diversified portfolio, um, you know, is it, actually less than, uh, you know, 20 basis points. That's, you know, think about this as two pence on a pound. Um, you know, and, and that's the result of the work that, that we've been doing. So, look, People are going to approach this in, 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 in different ways. I am a believer in the capital market. I am a believer in capitalism. And, you know, I think that there, there is a lot of work to do. There are other organizations um, doing the same. The thing people have to understand is high fees, high investment fees is not a fact of life. It's a choice, um, you know, that people, people make either deliberately or, or I'm afraid, um, you know, passively. But, but fundamentally, there are options out there. There are low cost investing out there, um, you know, and people just, just have to look. Thanks, Abraham. Thank you, Robin. So you've heard our opinions. What did you make of our latest interview? Please send us your views. Until next time, goodbye.